showing the PowerPoint now? Yeah, okay, great. Okay, I think we're, we're ready to go. Uh, our first panel will focus on ideology, on what Christian nationalism is and how it's related uh, to other ideologies and how we know. And our panelists are Bart Bonikowski, Jerome Kapolsky, uh, and Samuel Goldman. And we'll start out with uh, Professor Bonikowski. Thank you so much, Phil. Uh, thanks for those terrific opening remarks and for having uh, us all at this conference. I've got to say it's remarkable to have a conference on uh, na American nationalism, uh, to have so many brilliant people in one room and interested parties on Zoom. Uh, when I was starting to study American nationalism back in 2007, 8, uh, the literature on this topic was quite small. It was mostly historical or it dealt with extremist fringe movements. Uh, nationalism was seen as something that was other people's problem. Uh, even by 2015, 2016, with the rise of Trump, nationalism was still not a topic that was emphasized in scholarship or the media. Populism, radicalism, authoritarianism, yes. Um, xenophobia racism, um, Islamophobia, but not nationalism itself. Uh, so it's really a testament to the work of the people in this room that this topic has become so dominant now in our understanding of the rise of radical politics. Um, it's also a testament to the fact that radical politics are still, still very much with us uh, and becoming more and more dominant, if anything, across a growing number of country cases. Uh, so we're gaining a better understanding of that topic as we go along. Um, what I want to talk about today is really placing Christian nationalism in a broader perspective. So it's a little bit of uh, other ideologies, but also comparison, thinking about how we might think about Christian nationalism as a subset of other kinds of exclusionary nationalism that uh, we can find across a very uh, wide range of country cases. Um, so that's sort of one main uh, point of what I, what I want to talk about today. And the other one is really something Phil touched on uh, already, and that is in some ways, these attitudes that can constitute exclusionary declinist kind of, kinds of nationalism, these attitudes are not new, and neither are the political frames that elicit these attitudes, at, say, at the ballot box. So why now, right, the question that Phil posed earlier. Um, so the, the kind of the core question guiding my talk is why has the radical right become part of the political mainstream uh, across a growing number of contemporary democracies? This is a phenomenon that's obviously not limited to the United States. Uh, it's widespread across uh, Europe and far beyond uh, Brazil, India, et cetera. Um, there's some limitations I would want to point to in terms of existing explanations. Um, for one thing, there's this false dichotomy in a lot of coverage of radical right politics between economic and cultural explanations, the sort of uh, horse race of which one is it. Uh, I want to argue that that's actually misplaced. Economic phenomena are filtered through cultural understandings. Uh, sometimes economic phenomena are, are uh, a figment of, of cultural symbolic sort of um, 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 uh, constructs. Uh, there's also a lot of emphasis on status threat, but this has been ill-defined and uh, people argue over what it means, whether it exists. Uh, and again, status threat is also often seen as this cultural phenomenon separate for econo from economic grievance and other structural shocks. Um, culture itself has been reduced largely to outgroup antipathies, specific antipathies towards specific outgroups. Uh, and that sort of is where culture often ends as an expl explanatory factor. There's also the under theorization of nationalism itself. Again, reducing it to xenophobia, to nativism, to particular forms of uh, outgroup antipathy, rather than as a, as a kind of a full theoretical construct um, that uh, can help us explain a wide variety of cases. Um, my slide. I think Sorry. if I go, that's okay if we go this way. Uh, there we go. Is that okay? Yeah, I just went through my, turn the camera on. Oh, I see. Okay, perfect. I don't think I'm just going to see you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> All right. Um, there's also this issue of, um, of a conflation of a variety of ideologies, the topic of this particular panel. You know, we hear the word populism a lot, something of nationalism, authoritarianism. How do these things fit together? More generally, I think in terms of explaining the rise of the radical right, there's an emphasis on monocausal explanations, finding the one key that explains this, this form of politics across a very wide range of, of cases, um, which I think is problematic. Almost done here in terms of limitations. Another one is this notion that, well, if these frames, elite frames, mobilizing frames are pre-existing, the attitudes have been around, how can we explain change, the rise of radical politics, with stable cultural political phenomena? That's a puzzle. Um, 
And finally, um, something that I think is important for understanding my perspective on this is in trying to understand radical right politics across a range of countries, there's this dual problem of excessive particularism, right? So the election of Obama was extremely important in understanding the rise of Trump, but it certainly doesn't explain what's happening in Poland or the Netherlands. Likewise, in the Polish case, a plane crash that killed much of the government leadership um, and had been, has been since used um, to stoke Russophobic feelings. That doesn't help us explain the United States case, but it certainly is important in the Polish case. So that's, these explanations are important, again, at the level of individual countries, but not for explaining the, the broad rise of radical right politics. On the other hand, universalist explanations can be too broad too. Think of the facile comparisons of what's happening today with the 1930s. Um, so there is this tricky middle ground we need to occupy where we need to be sensitive to, ca to case specificity while also looking for overarching trends and patterns. And so I'm going to post to you in the brief uh, time I have left a theoretical model that tries to resolve some of these issues, um, tries to. So first of all, the radical right in terms of what is it? How do we think about this? Um, following Kasmuda and many others, I would argue that it's really a com composed of three phenomena, populism, which is um, a way of doing, of doing politics that uh, is based on a, on a um, kind of a, a moral binary between some sort of a corrupt elite and the people, um, fill in the blanks who the people are, uh, but the people should have unmediated access to political power. That, that, that's how populist arguments go. Second is authoritarianism. It's a mode of governance that essentially disregards dem liberal democratic norms and institutions uh, in the interest of preserving power and representing um, the constituency of the radical right uh, uh, against all odds and against laws, against um, norms. So those are two important elements. And the third, which we all care about in this room, is nationalism. Um, Christian nationalism is one variety of the nationalism I'm talking about, but it's, it doesn't exhaust the definition of nationalism or the restrictive ex exclusionary nationalism that we see in different countries. So what I want to propose to you is that um, in order to understand the, the rise of the radical right, we need to think about nationalist cleavages within country populations, distinct understandings of what the nation means to people. These involve um, symbolic boundaries, who gets to belong into, in the nation, who does not. Um, and Christian nationalism is certainly part of that, uh, one form of that in the United States and beyond. Um, but also what aspects of the nation should we be proud of or not? Should we be proud of the institutions, the state? or not, should we be critical of the state? Uh, what accomplishments matter? How do we think about national history, collective memory? What elicits pride and how does it tell us where to go in the future? And also um, attitudes about where the nation fits into the broader, broader world, chauvinism, right? Um, my country above all else, uh, my country is you know, better than all countries in the world. Americans uh, are sort of leaders of the world. It's one way of thinking about how America fits into the rest of the world. And I wanna to propose to you that these attitudes, these beliefs cohere into, um, into these sort of cultural models that define how people understand their nation. And more importantly, or perhaps just as importantly, these cultural models are heterogeneous within countries. That is, Americans disagree about what America means, much like the Dutch disagree about what the Netherlands means, and Poles disagree about what Poland means, and so forth. Um, they disagree about all, along all of these criteria, national belonging, national pride, uh, chauvinism, and so forth. Um, and in past work I've done, I've used survey data as well as textual analysis to identify these, these uh, com competing understandings of the nation, and to suggests that these are these um, um, essentially constitute cultural cleavages in the population that for most part are um, are um, unacknowledged for most part they are latent but in certain political historical moments they become manifest and they become politically mobilized um, and all of a sudden people start behaving politically voting for instance based on these understandings of the nation more than other concerns uh, other cultural uh, structural uh, concerns um, so these are pattern stable uh, cleavages correlated with a slew of uh, demographic and, and political attributes. And I want to argue that Christian nationalism in the US is one insta instantiation of one of these types of, of nationalist uh, um, configurations, what I call restrictive nationalism, a nationalism that is exclusionary, that is declinist, that is nostalgic, that sees the nation as going downhill and a nation that needs to be recaptured by its rightful um, owners, its rightful um, 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 population. And this force, I've shown in, in, in research, um, this is a, a plurality of most national populations in contemporary democracies. It's a powerful force um, across, across uh, the West. And this 
Christian inflection of this type of restrictive nationalism explains a lot in terms of the rise of radical right politics in the US, certainly, as many people in this room have shown, in Poland, in Hungary, in Italy, in a variety of other cases. But it takes on a very different form in Western Europe, for instance, and beyond. So Christian nationalism with a Christian adjective, white Christian nationalism may be less helpful in understanding Western, national, uh, Western European radical right politics, certainly less helpful in, in understanding say Indian radical politics. But the mechanisms that, that produce outcomes in these cases are actually quite similar, right? So if, if we sort of relax the white Christian nationalist label and think about restrictive nationalism in broader terms, the actual mechanisms that get us from grievance through mobilization to radical right outcomes are quite similar across these cases. So what I see white Christian nationalism as is an instantiation of this broader type of nationalism in this subset of cases, a really powerful instantiation of this form of, of restrictive nationalism. So um, I'm gonna wrap up uh, in a minute, but I just wanna kind of give you a, a brief overview of, of how all of this kind of fits together and, and give you a provisional answer for why now. How do we get from this particular historical moment uh, to, to the mobilization of radical right politics across such a wide range of cases with so many different starting points, very different structural conditions and cultural contexts. So I want to argue in a nutshell that these nationalist cleavages that I've, I've uh, pointed to are the fuel for radical right politics. Populist claims making, anti-elitist attitudes, low institutional trust essentially stoke the fire started by these nationalist cleavages. And then tolerance for authoritarian rule is the consequence of this process. Right? So the narrative is, if the country is rightfully ours, and insert ethno-racial religious categories, um, and if it's going downhill, whose fault is it? It's the fault of the elites and minorities. In order to get back the country that we remember, imagine, remember, um, we need to kick out the elites, drive down the power of minorities, and that may require authoritarian measures that run roughshod over liberal democratic norms. But it's worth it. Right? That's the argument. Um, now, there is this one puzzle that I mentioned and Phil alluded to that, look, these frames are not new and neither are other attitudes. So how do we explain change? And here, I think we need to think about changing resonance. That is the same frames and the same attitudes can become increasingly resonant in new contexts. And so what are these contexts? Um, I'll end on this sort of schematic outline of the, of the theoretical model. Imagine on the top side of the slide, um, you've got the supply, supply side of politics, the kinds of claims that political elites make. On the bottom side, you've got demand side um, of factors, that is attitudes and beliefs held by the public. Um, on both sides, you've got nationalism, populism, and authoritarianism, the three elements of radical right politics I mentioned. They function as frames and as sets of beliefs. For most part, over time, there's stability. The frames have been around. In the aggregate, most national populations are not becoming more exclusionary or more populist over time. If you dig a little deeper, there is change actually. There's a recombination of these frames to kind of arrive at winning political formulas. Uh, on the demand side, there is partisan sorting of beliefs. So for instance, I've shown in past research that in the 1990s, you couldn't predict somebody's partisan identity with their nationalist beliefs and vice versa. By the 2000s, nationalism and partisan identity are deeply aligned. So that Republicans and Democrats fundamentally disagree about what America is and where it ought to go. Um, there is, a, you know, in the meantime, there's also the erosion of older identities like labor union identities that used to give people a sense of worth, worth self-worth. And as those erode, nationalism becomes more salient. So there is change. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of structural change. There are a whole slew of real, imagined, amplified uh, uh, structural shocks and changes economic changes from economic crises, the industrialization, capital mobility, trade shocks, a lot has been written about this. Demographic changes, changes in migration, refugee flows, real and imagined. So even as immigration goes down, the narrative is that it continues to be a problem. Um, cultural changes from a culture that, popular culture that glorified white working class Americans to culture that's much more diverse and multicultural, not to say that Hollywood somehow has become uh, fully uh, equal in terms of race and ethnicity by no means, but, the, but what is sort of uh, glorified in public culture has changed. Um, security shocks, terrorism, et cetera. I wanna argue that these create a sense of in, in, inchoate fears and anxieties in the public, particularly among ethno-racial majorities, but inchoate fears. It is opportunistic political leads that come along and all of a sudden organize these inchoate fears into a sense of overall crisis 
right? They say, you should be afraid. You're worried about immigrants. You're worried about economic changes. You're worried about your parents did better than you or your grandchildren will do. Um, this is all part of the same problem, right? And the problem can be blamed on those people. That is those who are empowered today and the minorities that they're, they're in cahoots with. And all of a sudden you've got these fears turned into resentments. They're channeled into resentments, which creates essentially a sense of, um, of collective status threat among ethno-racial majorities across these very different countries. Again, different content, different ideologies, but different starting conditions, different structural shocks, but the mechanisms are quite similar across a slew of country cases. Once this perceived status threat is mobilized among ethno-racial majorities, you've got the mobilization of those pre-existing nationalist cleavages I talked about earlier, which then lead to the success of radical right candidates and parties in a variety of different ways. Once they're in power, often these authoritarian governance strategies I mentioned become operable. Now, the final thing I wanna say here, and this is, if you've been watching the rise of radical politics across countries, you start seeing that the number of negative cases keeps dwindling, right? People used to write dissertations about no radical right in Sweden. Two years later, there is radical right in Sweden and so forth, right? The number of negative cases is very small, you know, Ireland, Canada, maybe Portugal, but not really. Um, why? Well, the point is that this entire model that I just described to you, this kind of model, model of mobilization diffuses across countries. Politicians learn from one another across very different contexts. They learn how to mobilize support and their supporters learn what to be scared of and whom to blame across very different contexts. Likewise, these parties and politicians learn how to govern in an authoritarian matter, manner to gain their to get, get their supporters what they want. And so you get people as different as Orban and Kaczynski who can't agree on very much, right? One is cozying up to Russia, the other's power is based entirely on Russophobia. Yet they govern in very similar ways, right? So Orban learns how to uh, delegitimize the media, the courts, how to change the constitution, uh, et cetera, from people like Erdogan and Putin. Kaczynski learns from Orban, the whole thing diffuses, right? Both the model of mobilization and the model of governance diffuses. Um, and that's roughly, I would argue, how we get to similar outcomes in vastly different cases through a similar set of mechanisms. I'll stop there. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much, Bart. If we can't get that other camera back up again. Before I, uh... We're, we're just uh, for the moment going to use uh, use this camera here. Oh, here we go. Um, so our our next speaker will be uh, Jerome Kopolsky from Georgetown. Thank you, and uh, thank you for having me. And this is I'm looking forward to a, a really interesting um, and exciting and fraught uh, com couple of conversations over the next day or so. Um, at some point when we when we circle back to our conversation our, our, our discussion, I'm looking forward to uh, to speaking a little bit about the myth of the founding that Phil had mentioned as one of the components of Christian nationalism in America and the providential mission, and particularly the way in which this myth is is deployed by groups that are restorationist uh, in, um, in in concern. That that I think one of the thing one of the things that we're going to see in Christian nationalist movements in the United States is a sense of discontent with the moment that, that the America that, that we're living in now is not the America that we had lived in the past or that we ought to be living in in the future. And the way is to go back and to rescue this past, to restore some, some golden age. Uh, so there's a, a, a narrative of decline and fall of the Republic. There will be reasons for that decline and fall, including um, villains and bad religions and maybe problematic institutions that need, need, correct it, need correction, and then a way to get back to that, that restoration. And I think that's something that we've seen in the religious right, in the new religious right in the late 70s and 80s, in the Tea Party movement, and now in, um, in the Trump MAGA movement. Um, I want to give a, a relatively new example of this kind of restorationism. Um, that has that has recently emerged, and I think has tried to provide a kind of um, highbrow intellectual framework to to Trumpism in the past couple of years, and that is the uh, the movement that's been called national conservatism uh, that has been shaped by the Edmund Burke Foundation. 
Uh, and back in June, in mid-June um, of this year, the foundation released a manifesto, National Conservatism, a Statement of Principles. And the text itself was drafted by the organization's chairman, the Israeli-American political theorist, Yoram Pazoni, and several of his NatCon collaborators, including the journalist Ron Dreher and R. Reno, the editor of First Things. Its signatories included a number of men associated with Hillsdale College and the Claremont Institute, including Larry Arne, who was chair of Donald Trump's 1776 commission, and Michael Anton, who was the author of the notorious 2016 pro-Trump essay, The Flight 93 Election, and who briefly served in the, uh, the Trump White House. Such dozens of Trump world as former chief of staff Mark Meadows, Turning Point USA's Charlie Kirk, tech entrepreneur and billionaire mega donor Peter Thiel, and a smattering of conservative European intellectuals. They identified themselves as citizens of Western nations, as Protestants, Catholics, and Jews, open to collaboration with similar non-Western movements in the post-liberal counter-revolution. And notable in their absence of um, in the signing were past NatCon fellow travelers such as Patrick Deneen and Saurabh Amari. Uh, so I want to spend a, a couple of moments talking about um, what the statement was saying and how the statement was presenting um, a kind of a, a conservative nationalism that was trying to reassert the place of religion and particularly Christianity in the public sphere. While the document paraphrased the preamble to the Constitution, and I'm quoting it now, the independent nation state is instituted to establish a more perfect union among the diverse communities, parties, and regions of a given nation to provide for their common defense and justice among them and to secure the general welfare and the blessings of liberty for this time and for future generations, unquote. There was no mention at all in the document of the principles of the Declaration of Independence, notions of equality, natural rights, consent of the governed. The Federalist principle of delegating uh, power to the states was endorsed, but only to a point. The document stated, quote, in those states or subdivisions in which law and justice have been manifestly corrupted, or in which lawlessness, immorality, and dissolution reign, national government must intervene energetically to restore order, unquote. Despite the deployment of the language of constitutionalism, the details departed from America's actual and longstanding political traditions. It was not hard to see the desire to impose a, a vision of religious and, and cultural integrity, which the country never had, from above. And perhaps nowhere did the statement of principles do so so deeply as in its section on God and public religion. And I want to read to that, that text itself. No nation can long endure without humility and gratitude before God and fear of his judgment that are found in authentic religious tradition. For millennia, the Bible has been our surest guide, nourishing a fitting orientation toward God, the political traditions of our nation, to public morals, to the defense of the weak, and to the recognition of things rightly regarded as sacred. The Bible should be read as the first among the sources of a shared Western civilization in schools and universities, and as the rightful inheritance of believers and non-believers alike. Where a Christian majority exists, public life should be rooted in Christianity and its moral vision, which should be honored by the state and other institutions, both public and private. At the same time, Jews and other religious minorities are to be protected in the observance of their own traditions, in the free governance of their communal institutions, and in all matters pertaining to the rearing and education of their children. Adult individuals should be protected from religious or ideological coercion in their private lives, and in their homes. Uh, so I read that and I was like, wow, that's kind of establishment -y, right? Like there's a really, this is not just we should have some more Christian or Judeo-Christian or religious symbols in the public sphere that people should feel confident to be able to bring their religious beliefs and practices into public life. This seems to be an attempt to frame the state and its governmental institutions um, and its social institutions with a religious vision, even though that religious vision is, is fairly vague in the way it's set out here. You know, it's, it's one thing to propose that public life should be rooted in Christianity and its moral visions, that the Bible should be read in public schools, that the Sabbath should be respected 
that authentic religious tradition ought to shape morals and so forth. But it's a bit more complicated to spell out the particulars. So for example, which Bible is to be read? King James, the, 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 the Christian Bible or the Jewish Tanakh, if we're looking at the Christian Bible, the King James Version, a Catholic, a Catholic translation, another translation, who gets to interpret the Bible? The Bible's not a self-glossing document. Um, how is Christianity to be honored by the state? What does that mean to honor Christianity? In what manner is the Sabbath to be observed? What day is the Sabbath to be observed? Um, can protection uh, from coercion in private coexist with public coercion? Can non-Christians serve in government in the scheme um, or vote? And the proposal also raises the question of who gets to decide whose religious tradition is authentic or not, or orthodox. So again, the, the, this becomes a very fraught move to try to reinsert religion or Christianity into the public sphere. Um, now, some may concur that the Bible is our surest guide but we'll disagree about what the Bible actually commands and forbids, how the weak are to be defended, which things are sacred and how they're to be so recognized and so forth. American history records many such quarrels between and among Anglicans and Congregationalists and Quakers and Presbyterians and Baptists and Methodists and Unitarians and Catholics and Mormons and so on, let alone Jews and other religious minorities. I could mention one argument on how the Bible is should be interpreted in the uh, 1850s and 60s. Is the Bible uh, preach abolition or does the Bible teach obedience of slaves to their masters? This was obviously a very fraught uh, question of biblical interpretation in uh, the antebellum America. Uh, and it is not one which the uh, writers of this document seem to have even considered could be raised in their, um, in their Christian state. Moreover, such a promotion and encouragement of a public Christianity seems to come, as I mentioned, perilously close to the establishment of religion. And in the American case, its full, full realization would effectively require the repeal of Article 6, Section 3 of the US Constitution, right? no religious test for public office, as well as the religion clauses of the First Amendment. Indeed, the proposal itself stands in tension with the Constitution's subsequent, with, sorry, with the, the NATCON document's subsequent plank on the rule of law and its demand that all accept and live in accordance with the Constitution of 1787 and the amendments to it. The National Conservatives' call for public religion, in fact, reveals their breathtaking naivete, a misunderstanding of the nation and its history, an unsupported confidence in the ability of public officials to promote religion a lack of concern regarding the corrupting influence of religion on politics. It's a dark forecast of what NatCon's endeavor to achieve if they ever came to power. So the signatories, I think, would likely not want to admit that what they're really calling for is a kind of refounding, a kind of rewriting of the Constitution of 1787 um, and of the uh, amendments and traditions which have come from that. But they do recognize that the proposal stands in fundamental tension with the constitutional settlement of the relationship of church and state that came to be in the mid 20th century. In a book published earlier in the spring, Yoram Hazoni noted that, quote, the key to such a restoration would be an overturning, would be overturning the post-war Supreme Court decisions that imposed the principle of separation of church and state in America. More than anything else he wrote, these sweeping decisions delegitimized Christianity as the basis for public life in America and for other Western countries and initiated the ongoing cultural revolution with which we are familiar. Getting rid of that legal regime would allow for robust involvement in public religion. Later, the, later this, that same month at the NatCons released this manifesto, the Supreme Court concluded arguably its most momentous term in recent years. Aside from the Dobbs decision, which overruled Roe v. Wade, the conservative supermajority decided two religious liberty cases, Carson versus Ma uh, Macon, which required state refunding for a sectarian school in Maine, and Kennedy versus a Bremerton school district, affirming the right of a public school football coach to pray in the 50-yard line after games. <clears throat> 
In doing so, the court furthered its dismantling of the post-war separationist settlement using the free exercise clause to overrule establishment clause concerns. The cracks and fissures in the wall of separation have opened into a breach. The question remains whether or when those who demand religious liberty for themselves will succeed in, rest in restraining it for others. Hazoni believes this counter-revolution would be contingent upon the justices demolishing the wall its, presidents, its predecessors had foolishly erected. It appears that his hopes may be on their way to being fulfilled soon. And uh, I'll stop there. Here in person and uh, on the internet, with the attention, I also apologize for the mess you may have made. So, uh, my uh, remarks um, will focus uh, on the relation between the idea of America as a Christian nation and uh, for turning to that topic, I, I think it's worth saying a few words about why it's particularly important. Um, and it seems to me that there, there are three reasons. Uh, oh, thank you. I apologize. Uh, it seems there are three reasons uh, that the role of Jews in Judaism uh, looms particularly large over this conversation. Uh, the first is that Jews and Judaism are a theological problem for Christians in a distinctive way. Uh, Christianity, as we all know, emerges from uh, Judaism and the relation between uh, Christianity and its Jewish sources uh, has never been permanently or uh, consistently resolved. So in any appeal to a Christian community, it's very difficult to avoid uh, ultimately confronting the question of the role of Jews. Uh, a second reason uh, has to do with the presence of a Jewish community in the United States um, from the colonial period and into the early Republic. Um, early America was characterized by an unusually high degree of uh, religious pluralism, um, but most of the uh, participants in that plurality uh, were themselves Christians, and many of the debates uh, in the founding period about the nature of religious establishment or the relation between church and state were debates among different Christian denominations. Um, Jews were, I think, the only only uh, religious community at the time that was considered both legitimate, um, unlike Native American religions, and perhaps to the extent that it was present, uh, Islam as practiced uh, primarily by uh, slaves, um, both as legitimate, but as altogether non-Christian. And that, once again, makes it very difficult to avoid the question of its significance for an American Christian nation, even though at that time uh, the Jewish community was extremely small, likely under 5,000 people. Uh, finally, uh, Jews have played a disproportionate cultural role, particularly in the 20th century. Uh, and Jerome was speaking um, a few moments ago uh, about the constitutional revolution um, of the mid 20th century and the new jurisprudence of church and state. Um, it was accompanied and in many ways prefigured by a cultural revolution um, in which Jews played a distinctively large role. So for all of those reasons, uh, I think the question cannot be avoided. Now, it would seem that the implications of the claim that America is in some fundamental sense a Christian nation uh, would be uh, straightforwardly anti-Semitic. Um, you might think that at best, Jews can be sojourners in a Christian nation, uh, and at worst, they might be seen as inherently subversive. Uh, these are opinions associated with figures like uh, Henry Ford or uh, Gerald L. K. Smith, the, the leader of the Christian nationalist crusade of the 1940s. And a more recent uh, example might be found uh, in figures like Andrew Torba, uh, the chief executive of the GAB social media platform. Um, 
But what I want to suggest this morning is that that kind of fervent and consistent anti-Semitism uh, is not the only possibility and historically is probably something of an outlier. Uh, contrary to expectations, uh, many theorists and advocates of America as a Christian nation have also expressed enthusiastic views about Jews and Judaism. And I think this, this widespread, if by no means universal disposition is among the features that distinguish American forms of uh, Christian nationalism from European predecessors and counterparts that very rarely, if ever, have this, uh, this feature. It's helpful to disaggregate this broad generalization about favorable attitudes toward Jews and Judaism um, into three basic themes or tropes um, that can, of course, be expressed in different ways, um, but I think recur extending all the way back to the, the early uh, period of the American Republic. And the first, uh, which Jerome alluded to a moment ago, um, is what I would describe as philo Hebraism. Um, embrace of the Hebrew Bible as the preeminent guide to politics uh, and an emphasis on the biblical people of Israel as the ideal political community. Uh, to promote understanding of the biblical texts, uh, Philo-Hebraism also accords high esteem to the Hebrew language uh, and to some extent uh, to rabbinic traditions of scholarship and interpretation uh, as well as Christian sources. In the specifically American context, uh, and as Philip has shown um, in his historical work, um, this is not a, just a uniquely American idea, but in the American context, uh, this philo hebraic trope um, is associated with historical interpretations that emphasize Puritan influences on independence and the early republic, uh, usually at the expense, if not to the exclusion of Greco-Roman republicanism uh, and enlightenment rationalism. Now, Philo-Hebraism is historically linked um, to supersessionist doctrines in which uh, the, the Christian church and perhaps Christian America itself uh, fulfills biblical prophecies and becomes a sort of second Zion or new Israel. Uh, and at least until uh, the later 19th century, and in some ways until the 20th century, such beliefs were also associated with missions intended to secure the mass conversion of the Jews. But there is another version or strand of Philo-Hebraism um, that overlaps with Zionism. Um, and on this view, which I've explored at some length in my book, uh, God's Country, American Christians are seen as having a special calling, a special task to assist in the restoration of the original chosen people to the biblical land of promise um, with the prospect of conversion, sometimes deferred until the end times. It's not something we need to worry about. God will take care of it when appropriate uh, and sometimes abandoned altogether. Um, and in a less theological vein, uh, as the historian Walter Russell Mead notes in his recent book, Ark of a Covenant, um, Philo-Zionism also offered um, a respectable basis for criticizing mass Jewish immigration to the United States, especially in the late uh, 19th and early 20th centuries. The, the argument was, yes, Jews are entitled to dignity and freedom and political autonomy, um, but they should do it in, in a Jewish community rather than as a part of Christian America. Now, for much of this uh, history, again, um, into the 20th century, Christian Philo-Zionists expected the movement for return to the promised land to be led by the most devout Jews. Uh, and even after 1947 and the establishment of the modern state of Israel, uh, many were troubled by the leading positions occupied um, by secular and often socialist Jews who didn't correspond to their expectations for this movement. But more recently, um, that tension between prophetic or mil millennial hope and practical politics uh, has been reduced by the growing prominence 
of religiously inflected Zionism uh, that draws on a distinctively Hebraic or biblical idiom, um, even when it is deployed by personally secular uh, figures. Uh, at the same time, uh, Orthodox communities in both the United States and Israel uh, have become vivid symbols of resistance to secularization. Um, and for that reason have, have become the object um, of admiration um, and emulation by many Christians who fear uh, that their, their beliefs, their, their communities and their traditions are threatened under modern conditions. I could say more, of course, about any one of these, um, but I, I think the brief description that I've given so far is sufficient to belie the assumption that American Christian nationalism is anti-Jewish per se. Uh, yes, strategic manipulation is always a possibility, and I, you know, I, I don't want to deny that these tropes can be invoked in instrumental or cynical ways, um, but I, I think it's actually a mistake to doubt the basic sincerity uh, of figures going back to the 17th century uh, who combine a vision of America as a Christian nation with genuine admiration for Jewish texts and learning, uh, for Jewish nationalist movements and institutions, uh, and for various forms of Jewish religious practice. But even when they are sincere, such attitudes involve a troubling omission. Uh, Americans who invoke the ideal of a Christian nation uh, may be genuinely friendly to the biblical Hebrews, to the modern state of Israel, uh, and to Orthodox communities, or to all three at the same time. But they have usually been suspicious of the vast majority of American Jews. And here, I, I think honesty requires one to say that there is some good reason for that. Um, because the bulk of American Jews are historically not only liberal in politics, religion, and culture, and that includes a more complicated relationship with Zionism um, than popular accounts tend to recognize, but also, uh, as uh, the historian David Hollinger uh, has argued in his new book, as well as uh, previous scholarship, um, American Jews played a hugely disproportionate role, both actively and symbolically, in the de-Christianization, if not outright secularization, of American public life um, around the middle of the 20th century. Now, this dynamic may change in the future uh, as differential rates of birth uh, and communal retention make the American Jewish community uh, more religiously orthodox and more politically conservative, even as the overall size of that community is likely to shrink relative to the US population as a whole. Um, but for now, at least, the gap between Christian nationalism and most American Jews remains very wide indeed. Excellent. So now we'll sort of shift to the conversational part of the panel and um, first to see if you all have any questions for one another or responses to each other's opening statements. Briefly, Mr. Master Samuel, this is a fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Um, and again, it points to this tremendous variation across cases, despite similar outcomes, right? Um, and the the role of uh, of Philo Hebraism you mentioned here, or Philo Zionism, in, in sharp distinction distinction to Eastern European anti-Semitism, which continues to fuel the rise of radical right politics, right? We're thinking about different cases in Poland and Hungary and other Eastern European countries, you've got deep anti-Semitism in the absence of Jews, largely and deep Islamophobia in the absence of Muslims. And yet quite similar outcomes and similar sort of, in some ways, even similar narratives around the importance of Christianity and Catholicism for, for public life and, and, and the state. Um, so just a comment more than a question, just a fascinating, fascinating narrative. Thank you for that. Actually, I want to add to that and you know maybe get some Sam's thoughts on this. I mean, one of the, the interesting things about Christian nationalism is that like Christianity, it's indebted to the Hebrew Bible. Right, it's that, and in fact, in um, in the 
the promotion of this kind of religious nationalism by Yoram Hazoni, his reasons for both nationalism and conservatism are based on his readings of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, so if you go back and you read Hazoni's recent book where he describes conservatism a rediscovery, he advocates for a Christian state, but the reasons for a, a I guess a Christianized state or the public, public Christianity in, in the state, in this case, modern America, is because of his understanding of how the Hebrew Bible provides a political foundation for the national state, and the Hebrew Bible provides a political foundation for his understanding of conservatism as a, as a way of being in the world. Um, and in this way, you know, Christian nationalism has at its core, I guess we can call it a, a Jewish problem, right? In, in the sense that Christian uh, nationalism is going back to the uh, sort of the Puritan vision, envisions themselves as in continuity with ancient Israel, where the new, the new Israel kind of living in a covenantal relationship um, and builds so much, takes so much of its imagery, takes so much of its energy, takes so much of its self-understanding from the political uh, ideas of the Hebrew Bible and then mapping them on to a sort of a, a, a different form of, of society, a different form of politics, right? So what does it mean to create a biblically inspired republic in North America by congregationalists um, or, by, or by evangelicals? And so are, are Jews a model or are they a, a competitor? And I think that different, different iterations of Christian nationalisms deal with real life Jews in different, in different ways and deal with Judaism as a religious tradition in different ways as well. So I thought I'd throw that over to you. No, I mean, I, I think that's, that's right. Um, and that's one of the reasons um, that even though in certain contexts, it can be useful to lump together different phenomena, um, it's also important to, uh, to distinguish them. Um, and I am troubled, you know, intellectually um, by the too easy association um, of Christian nationalist ideas and, and movements in America with the politics of the Euro of Europe in, in the 1930s. I, I just I just think the, the, the differences vastly outweigh um, the similarities. And that that has a lot to do um, with this powerful philo-Judaic strand or or strands, um, which again I'm not claiming is universal. There are figures like like Harry Ford or um, or Gerald Smith. Um, but especially since the Second World War um, have become much more prominent. And I think it's, it's very difficult to imagine um, at least modern variations of American Christian nationalism without some version uh, of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me just sort of uh, weigh in quickly with, with, with a question for you all, um, which is, Well, I think one, one of the recurring features of Christian Zionism, especially as, as it's developed in America, um, is that Israel or, or the pre-state uh, uh, Jewish settlement in, in um, Ottoman and then mandatory 
Palestine really functions as a kind of mirror um, for what American Christians see in themselves. And sometimes it's, it's a mirror of aspiration and, and hope. And that's the side um, that's become prominent here as Israel has emerged as a, a plausible model um, for a religious conservative society on modern conditions. Um, there aren't that many possibilities um, and Israel uh, is, it ranks high among them. Um, but also sometimes as um, a, a sort of vehicle for all that Americans think is, is worse in America. And I think you, you see that on um, elements of the religious left where, where Israel is denounced as an apartheid state or is practicing segregation, um, uh, which is par parallel. Um, but uh, what, what I think both those reactions have in common um, is they tend to tell you more about the people who are making the comparisons um, than about the actual situation um, in, in Israel or, um, or among Jews. And in, in that sense, um, I think there is a, a not, a, again, a, not, not cynical or instrumental quality uh, necessarily, but there, there is something um, a little bit narcissistic about it. Um, question, Chad? <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I think the, these arguments always imply, even if they don't explicitly draw a distinction between good Jews and bad Jews. And the good Jews are the ones who play their appropriate role, whatever that's, that's understood to be. Um, the bad Jews are, th are those that, that don't. And once again, you know, I, sh I should be clear, this is not only um, a tendency in conservative or nationalist Christian traditions. You, you, you see different but structurally similar uh, distinctions uh, among, among liberal Christians on, on all of the same, uh, the same issues. So there's always an implied uh, or else. Um, and I think that's, that's the consequence of treating the existence and prospect of Jews from within a Christian frame. I mean, the question is what role Jews play in a Christian story? And the answer depends on, on um, the particular form of Christianity, but the, the, the assumption about who, whose narrative it is doesn't change. Um, also, just, just briefly, um, since, you, since you bring it up, I'm, I'm fascinated by the, the de-Judaization of, of some of these tropes. I mean, because I, I, I agree um, that a lot of the rhetoric of anti-globalism, anti-financial you know, financial speculators, even, even specific figures you know, like, like the Rothschilds is used by people who have no idea of their historical 
associations with Jews or, or anti-Semitism. And I, I don't, I, I confess that I don't know quite what to make of that um, because it's very hard for me to see this language and not hear um, the, the resonances of a hundred years ago. Um, but I think just empirically, most of the people who do speak this way um, just, just don't make that association. Can I just add one more thing in terms of to keep bringing back the comparative perspective. In Western Europe, there's an interesting tension of the same sort, right? Where you've got, on the one hand, to the degree that Christian nationalism may be useful for explaining some of these developments in Western Europe, the civilizational language around Judeo-Christian European values, right? Which is used to demarcate the boundaries against Muslims. Uh, there, it's interesting, right? Because it's about women's rights, about gay rights. It's about kind of a, 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 a culture of openness to which ostensibly Muslims uh, don't adhere, right? That's the boundary drawing. But you also have exactly what you were just describing with, with these kind of globalist uh, arguments. I mean, the Italian election that just occurred was full of this stuff, right? About, about speculators, about globalists. And so it's sort of a multivocal use uh, and, and exploitation of these arguments for, for radical right pens in an interesting way. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, this panel. Um, so yeah, you, we, we've already gotten onto the good Jew, bad Jew distinction, which I think is really important for understanding uh, what's going on in the global right. I mean, Dugan even draws the good Jew, bad Jew distinction. One could give a talk saying Dugan isn't anti-Semitic because he, he, he's, you know, very clearly, he says, I'm the big defender of Jews because I'm defending them from the bad Jews. The most dangerous, Dugan has a speech he gave in Jerusalem where he says, you know, I'm the big defender of Jews because the enemy of the Jews are the bad Jews. Uh, and, and, and even Hitler in Mein Kampf uh, says that, you know, when I, when I thought that when I thought that anti-Semitism was about religion, I was really opposed to it because anyone can have any religion. But then I realized it's really about this communist takeover. Um, uh, so, um, so I'm wondering about the minimization of anti-Semitism among white Christian nationalism. Uh, also the American tradition, uh, the second clan is very clearly anti-Semitic. And when I see, uh, you know, the, the, they're blaming, they have, they have all that. There's a ton of stuff in the second clan, which is about Jews coming down to, uh, you know, set up labor unions and such like. Uh, and insofar as we trace the, uh, and, and, you know, the South has a long tradition of, uh, of, of <laughs> anti if we trace the white, white Christian nationalism to the second clan, those elements, the white and white Christian nationalism, um, I'm hesitant to minimize the anti-Semitism involved. So, Mark, I'd like you to expound, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, expound a bit on some of these international aspects. Um, one question is the role of individuals like Steve Bannon mm -hmm. in terms of seeding various tactics. Um, which might involve the mobilization of rural populations in opposition to urban populations, uh, certain media tactics that you see replicated across different countries. <clears throat> and another element that I wonder about is the difference between these movements in Western Europe and the former communist states. Uh, I remember being shocked at a, at a conference some time ago uh, pre-Orban that said that the majority of Hungarians voted or, or, or were polled to favor a one-party state. And this was some time after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And if you can extrapolate that to how it might relate to Putin's Russia. Mm -hmm. There's a lot in there, but I trust you to tackle it. <laughs> um. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, thank you. A lot there are terrific comments and questions. Um, I mean, the question of Bannon raises the prospect of sort of a populist international that people have talked about. Um, I think there's some evidence of the fact, you know, with the photos and get togethers among leaders of radical right parties across European uh, and, 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 and uh, states in the US. Um, and that certainly happened. 
I think Bannon imagined himself as the facilitizer of this form of politics. Um, and maybe he played some role in, in helping diffuse some of the ideas among this cadre of radical right politicians. But really, I think that they're learning from one another just fine without him as well. <laughs> uh, and in some ways, the, the, you know, some of the kind of initial structural uh, uh, conditions that give rise to radical right politics uh, are already present in these countries. And so if anything, Bannon may have um, given us some ideas about tactics and so forth, but so did Nigel Farage coming here and, and spending time with Trump, right? Uh, so there is some of this diffusion with actual um, um, political uh, figures traveling across countries and, 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 and learning from one another, but they're also learning from afar, I think. Um, the, the second point you, you mentioned about urban versus rural, so this is, I think you're absolutely right, this is a very consistent feature of a lot of these uh, cases that the support for radical right parties tends to be concentrated in small towns and rural areas uh, and is very much opposed to the politics of, of large urban centers. Um, we see that with Brexit, we see that in France, we see it, we see it uh, time and again across these countries. Um, and it, I think it points to, again, the similar set of mechanisms across these otherwise diverse cases where um, those who feel left behind, but not you know, economically, but also culturally and demographically and in every other way that, we, that I sort of pointed out to, uh, point, uh, pointed out have, uh, can be mobilized using a set of similar, uh, similar claims and mechanisms. Um, the contrast between Western Europe and, and post-communist states is, is really interesting. There are many contrasts to, to one could make. You know, I already alluded to the use of um, women's rights and gay rights uh, in Western Europe as a way of mobilizing Islamophobic sentiments. This was something pioneered by Pim Fertin in the Netherlands, then taken up by uh, Herd Wilders and many others. Uh, um, in Eastern Europe, you've got the exact opposite. In Eastern Europe, you've got what you know a critique of what's called you know, in many countries gender ideology, which conflates you know gay rights, trans rights as 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 the thing to be afraid of. Right? This is coming from Western Europe. This is liberal values. This is anti-Catholic. Um, so a very different kinds of discourse used for similar ends. Um, but you also uh, you know mentioned this this poll in Hungary. Uh, opposition or support for one party rule. Um, there is something that's specific to Eastern European cases um, that that you don't find elsewhere. And that is um, the kind of post-1990 uh, um, frustration, disappointment uh, with, new, uh, with neoliberal market reforms and, um, and the rise of democratic governance. Um, people expected, um, you know, paradise and what they got was neoliberalism. Neoliberalism can be tough. <laughs> uh, it creates inequalities. It creates uh, a lot of disappointment in, in these countries. And the way this manifested itself is in, in incumbent fatigue. So in a lot of the countries in Eastern Europe, uh, very few parties remained in office for more than one term. And people kept just kicking them out, getting the next ones in, right? And eventually what that led to is general disaffection towards uh, mainstream politics, mainstream parties, uh, which created partly an opening for more radical uh, parties or for the radicalization of existing mainstream parties like, like Peace um, um, or, or Fides. So, um, and, and of course, you also alluded to Russian influence, which in a lot of these countries, uh, you know, certainly in Hungary, uh, is an important factor as well. So, terrific comments. Sorry, thank you so much. Um, my, my question is with regards to um, two things. One is nationalism, one is patriarchy. So I wonder to what extent actually nationalism is much more stronger, a, a kind of part of that deep story, especially across the Atlantic. It seems to me like there's a, there's a sense, um, and I think um, um, you mentioned that uh, before, uh, that Nationalism is actually something that hasn't been too present, actually, um, of late, and a lot of people haven't really talked about that. But in a way, one could argue that actually nationalism is the kind of the binding glue, like what well, maybe the most powerful concept of of, of modernity and, and politics and modernity um, at all. So it's, that is actually something that has been much more coherent there. And then my my question is also to what extent. Is it exclusive nationalism or is it nationalism per se? Like, is there ever a nationalism that is not exclusive? 
that in democratic theory called the boundary problem, right? You always reaffirm one com political community over the other, and it has always strictly linked, been linked with race. But even if it's if it's not, even if that is achieved, is linked with certain culture, and then culture kind of uh, gets replaced as that um, by which um, um, exclusion happens. So, isn't kind of if you say exclusive nationalism, you're actually kind of vindicating nationalism, um, which is maybe the core problem. And the second question is about patriarchy in terms of how that features as a core element of, of that ideology. That seems to be kind of in interestingly absent from the debate, but um, 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 when we, it was mentioned before about kind of LGBTQ obviously um, playing a, a key role, kind of genderism and that um, as, as, as kind of uh, dog whistling or, or words that the radical right uses. And I wanted to, to what extent that is not necessarily and has been a key element also of the story that um, 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 Phil is telling in his book and has been over, over hundreds of years. And of course, there are certain iterations now with Maloney and Le Pen in France and so on that change that slightly. So I'd be interested in how it's kind of maybe twisted a bit, um, but um, I would argue that it is an absolute key element, the, 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 the Christian family, of course, the pre preserving that family, and how it's been used even, final point, in the Netherlands, for instance, in a, in a way you could say let's what has been termed homo-nationalism, right? Like you use actually a, a certain um, defense of LGBTQ um, allegedly um, against immigrants. So my feeling is that kind of certain elements of patriarchy and gender play a key role in, in the ideologies that we've been talking about. Thank you. Uh, just on um, the relation between nationalism and exclusion. I mean, yes, certainly all, all nationalism is exclusive in, in some sense, insofar as some people are me me members of the nation and other people are not. Um, <clears throat> that said, it does seem politically and morally relevant that there are degrees of exclusion with regard to the actually existing uh, population. Um, and there are forms of nationalism that seem to embrace more, many, if not absolutely all uh, of, of the population that exists and others that uh, are focused on a much smaller and somehow sometimes minority cohort. So, you know, I, I think minoritarian nationalism maybe would be more, more precise um, than exclusive. Um, but I, I do think there's something that goes beyond the inherent exclusion, the, the inherent division between member and non-member, insider and outsider, that goes along with any conception of the nation. Here, here. <laughs> I agree, right? I mean, it's sort of exclusion based on what? Um, and there are degrees of exclusion and is it exclusion based on ascriptive criteria, elective criteria? You know, there you can imagine sort of a continuum and certainly people have written for a long time about civic versus ethnic nationalism, both exclusionary in the sense that there are boundaries to the nation, but the criteria of exclusion vary. Um, but nonetheless, it, it, yeah, that's a very good point. But on the patriarchy uh, uh, issue, absolutely. I mean, I think this is a hugely important aspect of, of radical right politics and nationalisms across all of the cases I've been discussing, and, and it, but in different ways, of course. Um, and so to the degree that there's a nostalgia for bygone era, a lost golden era of the nation, it often involves a sort of sense of uh, that that was a time when people knew their place, right? That means racial minorities, ethnic minorities, but it also means women, uh, right? It's a, if you think about all the arguments about masculinity, you know, whether it's Putin riding a bear or whatever he was doing, riding a horse and, you know, uh, with no shirt on, or all the arguments about, about masculinity and virility in American right-wing politics, it's, it's constantly there. The only interesting word of caution there is that some have argued, oh, this means that um, support for the radical right is predominant uh, among men. And of course, we've seen that's not the case, actually, right? So there is the same, you know, there, there, there is a, a, the power of this uh, patriarchal narrative um, also quite often um, works uh, quite well in terms of mobilizing uh, support by women for these radical right parties um, across a, a lot of these cases. And, and the final thing you point to is the changing face of radical right politics, the uh, maybe growing prominence of, of uh, uh, women leaders in these radical right parties. That's certainly been uh, part of the process. And, and I think it's been deliberate in many cases to kind of give ra the radical right um, um, a less patriarchal face, uh, but often in the pursuit of quite patriarchal policies and ideological stances. Thank you.
I have a question for Jerome, which is to ask about the, the goal of the manifesto. You know, you, you point out the incredible difficulties of implementing such a vision, uh, the specificities, the, the inevitable arguments and, and cleavages that would take place if one actually tried to do this. So I guess my, my question is, is, is the goal to actually lay out a, some sort of practical vision or is the goal to mobilize a certain imaginary, right? A, a certain imagined vision for a future that will mobilize a movement uh, in essence. So I think that's a question um, just on your specific example. I have a very different question for Bart, which is you've talked a lot about uh, the Euro European examples, Poland, Hungary, et cetera. Uh, but following on Anne's question about, uh, about post-Soviet Hungary, et cetera, I'm thinking about the Brazil example and the possible return of De Silva. And, and that seems to be not incumbent fatigue, but almost incumbent nostalgia. I mean, there's almost a kind of Biden, like he's, he's, we recall a status quo where everything wasn't chaotic. And so can we just go back to the guy that led us to a country that wasn't crisis after crisis, extremism after extremism every day. So I'm just wondering if, if where that fits in your model, because I, I really appreciated the way you laid out the symbolic cleavages, but I'm wondering when you have a kind of longing for a return of someone like the Silva, how does that, how does that fit into that model? So thank you. Thanks, that's a, that's a great set of questions. You know, um, the manifesto comes at an interesting time. And I think what, what's, what national conservatism movement is, I think was, was an attempt to, to do a number of different things. One, to create a new fusion of, of conservative energies in the Trump era, right? So essentially to, to, to do what say the National Review was doing in the late 50s and, and early 60s, but now do it in, um, in the 2000 teens and, and 20s. So to re, reshape what, um, what, conser what the uh, conservatives working together would look like in America, but also on, on an international stage as well. So they wanted to create a kind of a nationalist international, right? And that's what's so interesting about Hazon what, what Hazonis does is in his earlier book on the virtue of nationalism is essentially saying, if, every, if all states were national states, everything would be better. Right, so it should be a concert of national states as opposed to empire, as opposed to big globalizing universalist tendencies, whether it's a, sort of America or, or the EU or, or what have you, or, or you know, um, the, the old days, the, the Russian empire, maybe the new days, the Russian empire. Um, so on the, on the one hand, a new fusion in the United States, on the other hand, an attempt to create a, a kind of concert of like-minded conservative groups internationally in Europe, but uh, but not exclusively in Europe, and you know the the manifesto has a very American center of gravity to it in in its in its rhetoric and its appeal to um, the Constitution in its engagement with the question of race, um, but it's very very vague. Even even that passage on on public religion I, I read you, it doesn't get into details of what what did it, what would it mean to implement that public religion. So my sense is that it, it was meant to essentially draw a line uh, in the sand ahead of their, uh, their, their meeting, which was a couple of weeks ago in Florida, to essentially say these are general principles that we should now congregate around um, and that reorient what, this, what, what conservatism in the United States should look like and what conservativeness internationally should look like. Um, now, I, I think this gives me an opportunity to tack back to the question of patriarchy, because one of the pl planks in this text was on family, right? And you get a, a sense of what the, uh, the anxieties about the family are that are being promulgated here. So quoting, we believe the traditional family is the source of society's virtues and determines greater support from public policy. The traditional family built around a lifelong bond between a man and a woman on a lifelong bond between parents and children is the foundations for the achievements of our civilization. The disintegration of the family, including a marked decline in marriage and childbirth, gravely, th gravely threatens the well being and sustainability of democratic nations. Among the causes are an unconstrained individualism that regards child children as a burden while encouraging ever more radical forms of sexual license and experimentation as an alternative to the responsibilities of family and congregational life. 
right? And 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 this is something that you would a similar, I think, statement you would find in earlier manifestos of religious conservatives, right? That the the real danger to the republic is the disintegration of the family, rooted in um, the sexual revolution of the sixties. So I've got a couple of questions that uh, Jerome, I think, will want to weigh in on and might be of interest to other folks on on the panel at, as well. Um, so the, the, the first question I've been observing more and more recently, um, two things. And discussions about the founding, some people wanting to say, well, no, 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 the real founding was the arrival of the Puritans or the early English colonists who wanted to establish Christian nations, right? And that the different states were founded as Christian nations, that's one. Um, and then also in this recent essay that you mentioned by Michael Anton, um, reaching back to an emphasis on uh, the Declaration of Independence, focusing not on the preamble, but uh, or at least uh, not focusing on the parts of the preamble about you know created equal, et cetera, but the right to revolution, the natural right to revolution. So I, I'm just I would be curious. I know this is something that you you thought about a lot and studied closely, just to give us a sense of you know where those ideas are coming from and what their history is in the United States. That's the first question. The second question is, uh, you know, back goes back to your sort of opening statement um, about, well, how exactly would this work? And I mean, I suppose, you know, if and insofar as it could work, it would be some sort of a model of top-down consociationalism in which, you know, all Christians or most Christians were organized hierarchically, you know, with, you know, clear official, representatives who would be connected to the government in a certain way. I mean, a model that did exist, for example, say in uh, the Netherlands until the 60s, uh, in certain forms also in places like Austria and Switzerland. And I'm just curious, this, uh, is there, do they explicitly invoke this ever um, as a model, sort of you know, consociationalism, as it's often called by political scientists as a model? Uh, so briefly in the second question in, Hazoni's book, Conservatism, which came out in the spring, he does go into more detail on this, on this issue of public religion. And, and one of the details is he, he says quite explicitly, it was a mistake of the founders to leave out relig religion from the constitution. You know, in, in a way, I, I said earlier that, that Christian nationalism has a Jewish problem, but it also has a, an American problem. It's a founding problem, which is that the, the founding documents are, are not explicitly Christian, even the Declaration of Independence, and in some ways um, may, may push against Christian orthodoxies, particularly the natural rights doctrine in the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. Um, so there's, there's a desire on the one hand to say, well, these, the, the, the founding was to, create, was to create a Christian nation, but that is in a way belied by the actual texts themselves. So Hazoni, says, well, you know, it was kind of a mistake there. Um, definitely the jurisprudence of the late 1940s to the 1960s, which created a, a doctrine of strict separation between church and state, particularly in the schools with public funding, um, with um, taking out prayer in schools, with taking out uh, Bible reading in schools. Uh, this, this was a mistake and that could be unwound through, through, um, through the courts, uh, but he, it's funny because for someone who believes in the national state, here too, he kind of has localist solutions, right? It's like, well, you know, think this kind of public religion would look different in different places and maybe sort of states and regions ought to be the, the laboratories of this public public religion. So he, he again kind of pulls back a little bit from what that would look like, but he, he does explicitly say there should be carve outs for legitimate religious major, uh, minorities, right? Authentic religions. And the question is, well, who decides who's authentic, whose religion is authentic, right? Clearly he, he's, he's a, he's a self-proclaimed Orthodox Jew. He believes that Orthodox Judaism as he practices it is authentic, but he might not believe that reform or reconstructionist Jews are authentic. So maybe the state could come down on them harder than on the Orthodox Jewish community. So they're all, they're all sorts of puzzles that I think um, are sort of embedded 
in, in this project that haven't been worked out. And it kind of raises the question, is this really just meant to sort of create new, new ways of us to think about the problem, or is this something that could actually be put into practice next week? Just to add to that briefly, um, this, this issue of authentic religion um, really is important because the strict separationist jurisprudence of the mid 20th century was not entirely unprecedented, uh, but was novel uh, in the way in its in its expanse and, and the way it was applied. Um, but American reluctance to declare or recognize authentic versus non-authentic um, forms of religion really is pretty pretty consistent. There are exceptions. Um, the, the LDS church is, is a prominent example, um, but that really seems to be almost baked in. And it's not a result of secular liberalism. It's, it's a result of Christian pluralism and the existence of many communities and denominations that might have been happy uh, to distinguish between true and false religion if they were in charge, but they were too many and too weak ever to do that in a secure, mm -hmm. in a secure way. Um, so it seems to me that that, that problem goes deeper uh, in the American constitutional tradition than the strict separation of the problem. And, that, and that's very different, just very briefly, um, to, to many European and non-European countries that have long histories of the state recognizing and licensing um, legitimate uh, religious institutions and, and practices uh, and offering them certain benefits that are excluded to dissenters. Hi, thanks so much for uh, this panel. My name is Jonathan uh, Wurtz, and I teach here in sociology. Um, I had a comment slash question that related to Sam, your um, presentation and to Bart's. And it's, it's kind of connected to that last discussion, which is how, in what respects is what we're talking about really tied to or in any way restricted by any sort of coherence or consistency in the, the contradiction? I, I guess the, the opposite thing was that, that this, the, referencing to a deep story and uh, either that being within the frameworks of the American, the founding of this country or within the religious tradition, uh, discursive tradition through time through which in any substream of that in either Christianity or Judaism or, or somewhere else. And the, it, it's, it's connected to what you're sketching out in your model, Bart, which is a, there's a kind of a set of mechanisms that come together that the evocation of you know, just watch a Trump rally or watch a lot of the, 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 the spaces in which this actually happens sociologically, like people's hearts and minds, et cetera, is an instantaneous, it's, it's a kind of, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's pinging on parts of these, what kind of form these symbolic repertoires or whatever that do have the resonance that you're talking about, Bart, that may or may not have any relationship to consistency legally, uh, religiously and theologically, et cetera. Um, and in, I guess I'm just like, in, in that line, I think even on the question of white and Christian and nationalism, that the whiteness itself is something I wanted you maybe to address, that it's even there, it even contradictorily can resonate across racial and ethnic boundaries, that it doesn't have to be actual, like there's a lot of, uh, is that kind of aspirational whiteness or whatever, or just a sense of the resonance among religious communities for whom these, these collages, or I don't know what the right metaphor is of these symbolic collages, let's call it that, just still draw them in and they'll vote that way. It's like they're going to easily vote across something that seems totally contradictory, the like, what's wrong with Kansas type of stuff, um, because it's hitting something that works. And I guess in that, the last piece of that, which is consistent, is this transnational dimension in which um, you know, Sam, this was your thing. It was like you can. There's, it, there's no kind of no barrier to the internal contradiction of basically the resonance of these, you know, totally anti-Semitic tropes that have a total historical there and being ardently pro-Israel, being ardently pro-Zionist, um, both in this country. But I think this is where I'm going to draw it back, bring Brazil back, and bring in this broader global South connectivity of these networks that hasn't been talked as uh, about as much. In the ways that neo Pentecostal and other forms of networked Christianity, um, there's like a, a concatenation of those things together that these models they flow through those, I guess, 
uh, those networks, uh, relationships, and there's also just like a, a parallel uh, way that this comes together. And you wouldn't call it, it would be something like Christian nationalism, but you can transpose it into these other contexts. I just, I just smoke so <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. There's so much there, I, and I don't want to, I don't want to go on too long. Um, this question of coherence is interesting. I mean, there's a coherence to the, what I sort of described as the winning formula of, of nationalism, populism, and authoritarianism. They hang together, have a certain elective affinity that fills in gaps for each one of those things, right? So um, uh, populism posits the people in usually very abstract terms, unclear kind of vague terms. Nationalism helps fill in that content, right? So who are the people? Well, according to ethno-nationalism, it's, it's white Christian Americans, right? Um, if we want to restore the nation to its past, authoritarianism fills in that gap, right? Here's how we do it, by violating liberal democratic norms. So there's kind of a stru you know, structural um, coherence there, but you're absolutely right that in terms of filling in the specific content, there's, there's, kind of, there's a drawing of deep, on deep stories, but the degree to which those deep stories are reflected in actual reality is pretty flexible. <laughs> Let's put it that way, um, right? So something as simple as the fact that Mexican migration has been declining for years. But the story is that we have an immigration problem, an ongoing immigration problem. And that sticks and it works because it's a long-standing narrative that, that this discourse plugs into. Um, but I wouldn't go so far as to then, then suggest that the supporters of Trump or other radical right actors are duped by these narratives. In fact, there's a lot of research, uh, really interesting research that suggests that even when it comes to Trump's obvious lies, supporters typically know he's lying and they love it, right? So um, Oliver Hall, Minja Kim and Ezra Zuckerman have a terrific paper called um, um, the um, uh, something appeal of the lying demagogue, right? The, yeah, there's an the adjective there as well. But the point is that they actually show that supporters of people like Trump know that he's lying. And the reason they love it is that it shows them that he's willing to represent them. And he's willing to stick it to the system and to the establishment. The more he lies, the more represented they feel, which then creates, so it's not that they're duped. They're very much aware of that process, but it sort of, it speaks to them, uh, which then creates challenges for, let's say, fact checking. Fact checking doesn't work because they already know the facts. It's just that they appreciate the fact that he's willing to lie publicly, which nobody else is willing to do. Um, so that's just a point on the fact that, you know, th this is not about being duped. It's about the, these narratives being resonant, uh, even if they're unmoored from reality. And then we could talk about the resonance of these white Christian nationalist narratives among non-whites. Uh, and there, it's a really interesting phenomenon. It shouldn't be overstated, right? Trump was elected by white Americans. Period, full stop, right? Uh, women, men, uh, working class, middle class, just white Americans. But uh, certainly in 2020, to some degree in 2016, there was a small minority of African Americans and Latinos who also voted for Trump. And we're talking about you know, 10, 12%. Um, and that's an interesting puzzle as to why that might happen. Some of it is about religious conservatism. Uh, and alignment of, of those kinds of, of values and preferences. Um, some of it is about also sharing a distaste for immigration, right? Uh, even if uh, for those who had an immigrant background over the generations, you know, kind of like we're talking about good Jews, bad Jews, there's good immigrants, bad immigrants, uh, with a desire to protect uh, uh, people's place in the, in, the, in the status hierarchy in the United States. So there is that. And aspirational whiteness, as you mentioned as well, is probably part of the process. Uh, but again, these are really small, groups typically geographically concentrated um and it, it, it's important not to let that distract us from the fact that ultimately it was really white americans period who, who elected trump my instinct is is just to um push back a, a bit against the emphasis on sort of myth and psychological identification um you know m most of the the developments that we're discussing have, have really happened. Um, and whether people get them right in the details seems less important than the fact that the industrial middle class really has eroded. There really has been a revolution in expectations for sex and gender. Christianity and maybe religion in general really have declined in, in, public, in public status. So my, 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 my fear is that when 
people allude to myths or, or deep stories, you know, there's an element in which, in which that's true, um, but it, it can be a way of avoiding the reality of these changes and the way that people experience them. And even if you think these changes are on the whole good or unavoidable or, or necessary, um, the loss and discomfort and difficulties are, are real. And I think part of the appeal um, of the figures and movements we're talking about is they, they address the, that reality um, rather than denying or dismissing it. Hello, uh, thank you for all of your really interesting points. My question kind of builds on the discussion thus far and it has to do with the power of the underdog position, even if social, culturally, historically, they aren't actual underdogs, and what that allows them to do regarding how vague they are in like their constitution or like premise in who how Judaism meshes with Christianity of what are the causes of these structural changes. I'd be interested in any of the panelists speaking to the utility that it's as long as they aren't in power or can be perceived by their supporters as not holding the reins of government, they can kind of always make more general claims um, and never actually have to specify, oh, when we actually are in control, this is exactly how we're going to change the Constitution. This is exactly how we're going to regulate these types of things. Thank you so much. Um, I'll mention a group that actually had a very specific uh, change that they wanted to make and were fairly specific about what it would accomplish. And this was in the late 1860s, early 1870s. There, were, there was a, uh, a pan-Protestant movement uh, that was interested in there being a religious amendment to the Constitution. And the argument was the Constitution, America was, had a fundamental flaw, which is the Constitution didn't mention God didn't acknowledge God, didn't acknowledge Christ as the ruler of nations, didn't, didn't acknowledge the Bible as the, the fount of our laws. It, um, it had the First Amendment, which, a lot, which they, they were not interested in an establishment of a church. Most of these people, the, the, the leadership came from um, Scottish Presbyterian sects. But by having uh, the freedom of uh, free exercise clause, you allowed for, allowed for all forms of infidelity to, uh, to take place. And they looked at America in the, in the 1870s. They saw changing America after the war. They saw Catholics achieving political power and pushing back against um, public school uh, in the public schools about Bible readings of all things. Um, they saw Jews, they saw Mormons and Mormons publicly uh, embracing plural marriage. They saw secularists arise and they saw these people as a threat to their American way of life. And in fact, these people were becoming a threat insofar as they were challenging this longstanding pan Protestant non establishment, right? So they were pushing back against Sabbath laws, they were pushing back against um, the use of the Bible in public schools. So they believe that if you change the Constitution, you add a preamble with those things, you now have the legal basis to protect and preserve those Christian Protestant elements of American public life, right? So they were very clear what they would want. And this would, this would pertain to keeping things that were already there, um, Sabbath laws and prayer in schools and Bible reading in schools and, mili and military and congressional chaplains and the like, but presumably expanding or deepening the, the Christian nature of, of the state so that maybe you would, if you, Article 6, Section 3 of the Constitution then becomes problematic if you're making an oath to a constitution which acknowledges Christ, right? Um, interestingly enough, there was an attempt to do this in the, in, in the 1950s, and they created a carve-out in the proposed amendment for religious minorities, so they wouldn't run into that problem. So I think that's an example of, of saying, like, this is actually what we would do if we, we came to power. Now, there, there are other groups. So a lot of them are, restor as I mentioned, restorationists. We want to go back. To the way it to the way it was, um, but there are other groups like the, uh, the Christian Reconstructionists, for example, um, who I think <laughs> had, have a lot of, you know, maybe spiritual influence on um, on some of the people that we're that we're looking at today in the Christian nationalist um, frame. That you know what they would want to do is implement certain aspects of of Old Testament law, right? Or implement if you look at Catholic integralists, implement certain aspects of.
um, of Catholic religiosity in the public sphere. So, you know, I think some, some of it is kind of squishy, but some of it can be could be more precise and more targeted depending on who we're looking at. And again, you know, there's not like a Christian nationalist party yet. Maybe, maybe, well, maybe, maybe, maybe there is, but, but there are a lot of different, there are a lot of different flavors of, of, of religious nationalism and they have a lot of different understandings of what, what their nation would look like if they happen to come to power. So we've talked a lot about the, the long roots of nationalist projects, both in the US and globally. And this is probably primarily a question for Bart, but um, I have sort of a big picture question about those deep stories we keep talking about and sort of the mechanism by which that works. Um, and I'm hoping it might provide a better insight both into how that operates here and abroad. Um, the question is how those deep stories are identified and drawn upon is that, um, is that a conscious process? And are leaders of these movements doing that intentionally, strategically, even cynically, or is this something that's happening more organically as an outgrowth of you know, a genuine set of beliefs? That's great. Uh, and, although I don't have a clear answer to that difficult question. I mean, certainly one thing I can't, I, I just, it's hard to know what it, what's cynical and what's genuine. Um, but I will say that in terms of where these, let's, let's say where, where this conflation of populist nationalism and authoritarianism come from, um, sort of two answers to that. One, I think um, in the European case, the origins of a lot of these radical right parties are quite mixed. Some of them began as, anti, uh, began as neoliberal parties, anti-taxation parties. Um, they had a wide range of origins and they did start experimenting with these frames and seeing what sticks. Uh, so some of them became more populist over time when that worked, worked in the sense of gaining them support that would sort of, they would hold on to that. Uh, eventually, so this almost like a quasi evolutionary process. They kind of arrived at what became a winning formula that combined these three elements. And I think that's where the diffusion process then would take place is that, you know, politicians would look to one another across these countries and see, okay, that worked over there. Let's do our own version of that, fill it in with our own content. So that's, maybe that's one pathway to how these narratives become um, widespread and diffused. But I think another one that I've shown in some of my research, recent research on uh, political discourse in the United States in a post-war period using um, computational text analysis methods is that a lot of these frames existed in mainstream politics. Populism has been part of American politics for a very long time. Certainly in the day I've seen it since you know, 1945, we've seen it, we see it um, uh, fluctuating in both parties. Um, Ethnonationalism, less explicitly so, but through a whole slew of dog whistles at the presidential level, dog whistles and authoritarian kind of tough on crime, um, you know, uh, uh, welfare reform, all of those, uh, all of those moments in, in post-war history had a deep nationalist and racial inflection to them. Um, authoritarianism, you don't have to look far uh, in American post-war American history. And so there is a sense in which mainstream parties often talk the talk and didn't always walk the walk, right? This is a way of riling up the more radical supporters and then often when in power, yes, of course, there were all kinds of uh, rollbacks and all kinds of, um, um, you know, um, fulfilling of the promises, but always partial. And, I, and there's an argument to be made, Daniel Zibla has, has made it, I've made it with him in, in, a, in a Washington Post article at some point that when you do that enough, um, people want the actual promises to be fulfilled. And that's where radical right parties can come in and do that effectively. So, you know, the mainstream parties have been telling you promising populism, promise, you know, making populist promises, the nationalist pop, uh, promises, but not fulfilling them. We're, if you elect us, we're actually gonna make these things happen. Um, so in some ways, mainstream politicians legitimate narratives, um, maybe cynically, maybe not, uh, which then get, um, um, get exploited by the radical right in really powerful ways. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. I'm going to jump in on this very briefly as well, Sarah, uh, just offer three other sort of thoughts about the, about the question that you raised, which I think is, is a very good one. First one thing to underline is, is that there is what you could kind of call a Christian nationalist industrial complex. So, you know, these are, you know, events, um, you know, merchandise, textbooks that are used in, uh, you know, by Christian academies and Christian homeschools that they really do um, quite explicitly contain um, this kind of Christian nationalist deep story. So that, that, that's the first thing. I, I also 
I think Bart is exactly right that uh, some of this, uh, certainly in the case of Trump, really does have to be understood. I mean, he, he kind of focus grouped, he kind of backed into, mm -hmm. uh, he just sort of found certain tropes that worked, um, that resonated with a kind of Christian nationalist uh, deep story. Um, so I think that's uh, that's definitely, um, you know, uh, another another part of uh, of the answer as well. And then, you know, the third thing I would say is just that, again, this point I made in the introduction that, you know, there are ways in which um, you know, these Christian nationalist tropes also, uh, you know, are very much embedded in American popular culture. I mean, just think about the whole genre of post-apocalyptic novels and movies. I and mean, this is, you know, very common, very popular. And again, you know, these sort of, you know, heroic figures, you know, locked in this, a black and white melodramatic struggle between good and evil. So I mean, you you don't have to pick this up through you know some Abeka uh, textbook um, either. I mean, you know those those frames are always uh, you know all out there and available. And then one final thing is, just in terms of authoritarianism. I mean, um, look, I mean the Jim Crow South was a system of one party ethno cultural minority rule with authoritarian and violent means. And the fact that a lot of those arguments and strategies um, are suddenly percolating uh, to the top again is not least due to the fact that um, our national politics have been southernized uh, in many ways uh, in, in, in recent decades. Hello. Sorry about going on and on about my people, but I just there's one more comment I wanted to make about that. I mean, it's not just some subtle historical thing, the anti-Semitism of Christian nationalism. It wears it on its face and it wore it on its face it, on its face in your presentation, too, Sam, because dual loyalty is anti-Semitism. And the claim that the Christian and white Christian nationalists make about us is that our loyalty is really to Israel and we're American Jews. And our loyalty is not to Israel, it's to the United States. And anyone who conflates us with Israel is engaging in that anti-Semitic trope that goes back for a very long time. So I don't see how you can read white Christian nationalism as doing anything but furthering the dual loyalty trope. Furthermore, one point about the Nazis, the Nazis had a long discussion about what to think about Palestine and Israel. They decided, there were two views. One, they were going to support it because uh, it was a nationalist project. And number two, it was they were going to view it as the center, the hub of the global Jewish project. The Nazis, as Jeffrey Herf has made his later career out of, have decided, decided for the latter. Uh, but they could have decided for the former. <laughs> and uh, and so, but so I just wanted to just point out dual for anyone on Zoom, dual loyalty is anti-Semitism. I just say briefly that part of the irony is that for many Christian nationalists, um, American Jews loyalty isn't dual enough. It's, it's not dual loyalty. It's insufficient devotion to the state of Israel. And Trump made a comment of this kind after addressing some Jewish group several years ago, you know, he said, I'm, I'm more pro-Israel than, than, than these guys. So once again, um, I, I think it's not quite the, it's not quite the same thing. And although there are implications that are threatening implicitly and sometimes explicitly hostile to many American Jews, it's not just the same old thing uh, recycled. Okay, we've had uh, some some very good questions coming in uh, from from uh, the the audience on on Zoom as well, and I want to um, forward a couple of those to to the panel as well. Um, there are a number of questions that are about you know the way in which the role of big business and um, you know the way in which uh, you know who, what the money that's behind this and uh, folks who are wondering about that, I would just encourage you to stick around for the first afternoon panel, which will be exactly and primarily um, uh, about that question. But uh, a couple of other questions that, that have come up. Um, first one is, is, is for Bard. I mean, 
should we just think about um, exclusive nationalism, Christian nationalism, just as a kind of instrumental strategy to get votes? Or, um, you know, what's, I think it's a kind of question about what's going on in the politicians and the activist heads. That's a great question. Uh, I mean, I, in the sense that these, again, the beliefs have been around for a long time and people really truly believe in them. Like these are you know, genuine orientations um, toward the nation and um, toward politics. Um, so the, I guess the question is, and what is driving their instrumentalization by political elites? And it sort of gets back to this question of, is, it, is this cynical or is this genuine? Uh, is it a combination of those things? Uh, and it's, it's really hard to tell. I think to some degree it is about um, the exploitation of these fears and the ch kind of conscious channeling them into resentments by opportunistic elites. That happens. And you alluded to Trump sort of focus grouping. I mean, his focus groups were the rallies. And uh, uh, Rory McVeigh in his book on the Klan and comparing Klan and, and Trump actually has some interesting parallels. The Klan did something very similar where they would toss out a bunch of claims, a bunch of ideas and see what sticks. Uh, and Trump did that. I mean, the wall was a slip, right? He, he said this and people went nuts. And he said, okay, this, let's, let's hang on to that one. Uh, and then the things that didn't result in, in applause, you know, he would, he would abandon. Um, so there was this kind of dynamic trying to figure out what the audience wanted. But I think for, for each one of those examples, one can find examples of true devotees and you know, people who've been raised in particular traditions uh, and, and are, are, I think, true believers in the ideology and are pursuing what they believe is the rightful path for, for the American nation. So um, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna suggest that this is all cynicism. This is all um, just you know, kind of uh, um, uh, opportun oppor opportunism on its own uh, in kind of a raw manner. Um, but it's hard to know exactly what's in the heads of these politicians half the time. Right. I think we could be pretty confident that, um, say, Marjorie Taylor Greene or Doug Mastriano are speaking out of deeply held beliefs, right, even if there are some who are very cynical about this. Did you want to weigh in on this, Anne? There's been a, 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 an extensive machinery of the focus groups uh, long before Trump appeared on the scene. And you have uh, organizations like the Leadership Institute, which was founded 40 to 50 years ago, which has been launching focus groups and testing messaging. Um, and they claim credit for helping to make abortion uh, a third rail of American politics, whereas even the Southern Baptists of the past did not regard it as such. So they've been testing ideas, they've been testing languages, and, 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 and my belief is that that has been grafted on to the Trump campaign uh, very effectively, and that they will be happily desert Trump when it serves their interests. So um, we've also had a couple of other questions coming in over over the live stream that I wanted to sort of throw at, throw at the panel. I'm going to kind of combine them. So one of them, which I, I think is just a devil's advocate question, is like, well, you know, what's so bad about nationalism after all? Isn't nationalism a good thing? Which I think it's, you know, sort of, a, I think the real thrust of the question is like, are there good forms of nationalism that we could embrace? Um, or is national per se something that we should reject and a sort of associate question, which is on the relationship of nationalism and authoritarianism and democracy. I mean, is nationalism inherently anti-democratic? Is it inherently um, authoritarian? Or, you know, once again, I mean, can we envision a kind of a democratic um, form of, um, of, of, of nationalism? true were, so thank you for reminding me I, yeah i mean I, I i think clearly there are different forms of nationalism that can be more and less salutary um in different places and under under different circumstances and that's that's why i sort of hesitate a little bit when the categories get too broad you know if, if the alternative to nationalism in any form is moralistic cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism will lose every every single time. Um, so uh, both historically and I, I think in practice, appeal to some form of shared purpose and identity um, is, is really essential. And, you know, people distinguish 
patriotism or nationalism. I, I think the terminological debates are not really that, that interesting, um, but there are ways of doing that, that again, um, seem to encompass more of the actually existing population um, as opposed to those that pit uh, a, a true and authentic people that's only a portion, even a minority of the population against everyone else. That, that seems to me the issue here um, more than nationalism per se. Yeah, I, I second that, and I didn't talk about the other aspects of these nationalist cleavages that I've, you know, that I alluded to. I mentioned restrictive nationalism, but they're, they're, uh, you know, in my work, I've also talked about liberal or creedal nationalism, uh, about disengaged nationalism. There are sort of different forms of these understandings of the nation, some of which are much more inclusive, much more conducive to liberal democracy, um, not tied inherently to authoritarianism. So uh, I don't mean to suggest that nationalism is always a negative thing, although, you know, back to the question, but is it there's always some form of exclusion in terms of boundedness of the, of the nation state. But, um, you know, people have written about this. Yael Tamir has worked on liberal nationalism, Will Kimlicka talking about multiculturalism in the Canadian context and beyond. So there are ways in which the nation, sort of understandings of the nation that are more inclusive and more liberal democratic can be evoked in politics and often are. I mean, let's think about the, you know, the, the uh, uh, Democratic National Convention in the 20. Uh, 20 election or, or the 2016 election. I mean, there was a pageantry of kind of a, a liberal inclusive nationalism juxtaposed with Trump's exclusion. Um, I, I think the question is, there's a strategic question here. If we think that the kind of restrictive white Christian nationalism that is um, uh, part and parcel of radical right politics, if that is inherently illiberal and anti-democratic, how, what are the solutions? And what are the solutions from the left, maybe from the center right, right? Is the solution to offer a, a nationalist counterpoint and continue fighting elections on term, on, in, in terms of which nationalism we should favor? Uh, some people have argued that's a reasonable strategy. Or should the left, maybe center right, instead change the topic of the conversation and offer an actual vision um, that speaks to people's daily difficulties in life. That's a policy vision, you know, a vision um, that's in some ways been abandoned with the erosion of social democratic politics in, in, uh, in Europe and, uh, you know, in, with, with third way politics in the US as well. And so some have argued rather than fighting over which version of the nation should reign supreme, let's actually de decrease the salience of nationalist claims in elections and come back to actual things people should be arguing about, which is policy. But that's hard because as you were saying, the kind of virulent ethno-nationalism is a powerful force that's once, once you open that kind of worms, it's very hard to close it in elections, I think. Victoria, question. Did you also agree when you seconded that moral, moralized cosmopolitanism would be a failure or? I wouldn't go that far. No, I, I don't think I have very clear thoughts about that in the sense that um, we've seen it work in certain contexts. Uh, sort of the Canadian context is potentially one exemplar. Um, I think maybe where I would agree is that there is a certain kind of virulence again to right-wing ethno-nationalism that is hard to oppose with maybe kind of a uh, you know kind of milk toast uh, liberal uh, nationalism that is you know largely a negative vision like we don't like that we should all get along is not as powerful as, as the kind of ethno-nationalist arguments that you see on the right um, but i think there are more morally compelling versions of that again like multiculturalism you know which is which has an ideology that's deeper uh, built into it although it, by the way the canadian case i should say is it's not so idyllic it is also being challenged there's also a lot of backlash in canada whenever i talk to canadians about these issues they think oh you know we're sort of we're the, forever the negative case when it comes to radical politics and i always tell them just wait a few more years and it may not look so bright um i wanted to say something on the question of um should the left or the center um come up with their own version of nationalism and as the German on uh, in this conference, uh, <laughs> I'm somewhat uh, not just perplexed by this question, but um, yeah, uh, slightly shocked. And I can only I can I can see where the question is coming from because there is a need to present something that is as emotionally compelling, which is very hard to do. Uh, because the right preys so much on emotion, on fear, on anger. And it's very hard to counter these things with something positive that has the same effect. But I would caution is probably 
too, um, not strong enough a word, but I would warn against trying to beat the right wing at the nationalist game because, um, and I can only, uh, we can, I can only point to, to German history, uh, to even recent German elections, whenever the center, center left or well, mostly the center, whenever they try to co-opt certain um, aspects of right-wing nationalism that seems to work for the right, what it does is it mainstreams certain right-wing talking points and that does not serve the center in elections. It always backfires. So, uh, yeah, that's... I couldn't agree more. <laughs> that's what I meant by the can of worms is hard to close, right? As you're legitimizing the topic of the conversation and doing so and you will lose most of the time. Thank you. Um, I may be getting ahead of ourselves with this question because it'll probably come up later this afternoon, but it's it's sort of for Bart, but really for everybody. I wonder if we could just drill down a little bit more on the disinformation question and uh, that, that kind of lying demagogue comment um, might make sense when it comes to like a, a prophet or a leader who is that people are admiring, but it doesn't really explain why QAnon or why vaccine uh, disinformation, or why there's so much more of a concentration among Christian nationalists. I know Sam has done some work on this, so maybe we'll hear about it later. But, but any sense of like how this, how these frameworks of thinking relate to the whole landscape of just conspiracy theories and disinformation that's ramping up? You know, I, I think briefly this comes to the question, I, I mentioned earlier this notion of like a, a, a good founding and a decline. Like it, we, there, there was, they did something, the founders did something right, and but now things are, are we, we've fallen away from our republic and why? And, and what, is, what is the cause? And the cause is usually something like, well, bad religion, apostasy, right? The people, the people sort of fell when, 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 when searching after other gods, right? Um, or it could be, you know, bad people. Right, no, all these people who weren't part of this original stock are now coming into the country, and they don't hold the same values. Um, or it could be bad institutions, um, or some combination of the three. And I think if you, you know, if we go back to look at, say, um, the John Birch Society, right, which comes out of McCarthyism, right? So McCarthyism begins with, the, well, there are these bad people embedded in our own government, right? There, there are all these, you know, communists in the State Department. And then the Birch, the Birch essentially ra radicalized that idea, right? And say so that, you know, in fact, the, not, not only, you know, in the deep state, but maybe the sort of the, the main actors themselves. Um, and that explains why, you know, we are, we've, we've now fallen away, right? And so there's, there's this idea of like, you, you need to e expose what's really going on behind the scenes to understand you know, how we've, how, how we've fallen. And I think that they're real in, interesting um, echoes in things like QAnon to the Birchers or to um, the, the, the gay panic of, of the 70s with Anita Bryant, with the, um, the satanic panic of the 80s, right? A lot, a lot of this has to do with purity. A lot of this has to do with, with sexuality um, and, and people who are in influence who are actually, who are not like us, who are, who are trying to, so I think um, that the way in which the, the disinformation or the conspiracy is explanatory for how we've, how we've sort of declined and also then provides a map to how to get out of it, right? Well, now we've exposed, right, the problem. Now we can go in and challenge it directly. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I draw a slightly different conclusion from the the. Bircher example, which I, I think is a helpful one. Um, it, to me, what that suggests is that disinformation, misinformation, no information, conspiracy theories flourish when there is a real problem that is not acknowledged. And then people say, I, I can explain that to you. I can tell you why that's, that's happening. Um, and that's why, again, and I, I've made versions of this comment um, in answer to, to different uh, questions, I think it is not helpful to emphasize models of right, populism or Christian nationalism that depend on people being confused or misled or misinformed. 
um, rather than those that take seriously what they're saying about their, their experience, which may well, you know, granted, not be correct in, in every detail. Most of us are not correct in every detail of everything we say, but being willing to acknowledge that there is some basis in people's lives for their confusion, for their, for their, for their anger, um, and for their, their discomfort. And I, I think, again, it may well be true that there are networks of disinformation and so on, but emphasizing those seems to me a diversion from the real underlying issue. I'm just going to sort of jump in very quickly and, uh, with another little comment, one short term and one long term. So, I mean, you know, long term, um, to put it bluntly, the end time story is kind of the mother of all conspiracy theories in the United States. Um, and I, I think it, you know, creates a certain habit of thinking in a way that's sort of um, fundamentally conspiratorial. Um, and then the second sh shorter term thing that I would emphasize is uh, first of all, the, you know, the growth of that kind of thinking during the 20th century uh, amongst uh, evangelicals, um, so-called premillennial dispensationalism. But more, more recently, um, you know, with uh, its kind of radicalization um, amongst Pentecostals um, who imagine that we're engaged, in, not just that there's going to be some struggle, you know, somewhere down the road, a struggle is going on all the time right here right now with sort of shadowy and, and hidden forces. And so I think that does within this particular, you know, that helps to explain the link between white Christian nationalism and conspiracy theorizing more generally. I think we have a couple of questions popping up, Anthea, and then Dan, yeah. Anthea Butler, University of Pennsylvania. I'm sitting here laughing in the back because I'm like, well, if you're not talking about the media industrial complex, you aren't talking. Because basically you can say everything you wanna say about people being upset and grievance, but the grievance industrial complex, which operates on Facebook, Twitter, all of this stuff, you have to understand that this is a network that echoes back to each other, that is networkized to Christian religious people, to organizations. And we haven't really talked about the ways in which those kinds of places, whether we're talking about the World Magazine or all these other things, are actually helping all of this. They are the ones disseminating ideas for people to get. And so people just don't sit at home going, I'm mad because I don't have a job. These people are telling them how to be mad. And if you don't understand that people are telling you how to be mad right now, you do not understand what is going on here. You can't because you're, you're operating in a realm of ideas when these people operate in the reality of, I feel persecuted, I'm a white person and I feel mad. Why are all these black people getting out here to say that they're persecuted when in fact, I'm the one that's been persecuted all this time? Okay, and one more thing, I gotta, I gotta call this out because we've been talking about Zionism and everything else. If you don't understand also that the whole idea about Zionism for evangelicals is about you gonna get Jesus, whether you like it or not, then you're not talking about what's real here because basically you all gotta get saved. This is not about, you know, some nice little, you know, thing. It's like, oh no, you're gonna have Jesus one way or the other. And that's the way that this goes. So all of these ideas are circulating in this realm of social media and all of this stuff. I've been watching this for years. I've been attacked by these people. And so one of the things I think is really interesting and what I realized when we started talking about all this was that, oh, wait a minute, you know, Breitbart, all these people are working together. There's a food chain that this goes up. And now that food chain has hooked up to the religious food chain and you have an unbreakable chain. And that chain is, it can't be bought by trying to pretend that you can use nationalistic ideas to get to these people. You can't, that is solid. And once you understand that, then you know what we're up against. Thank you. That's a terrific comment. Um, and I agree completely. I mean, part of the what I was trying to express in the theoretical model is suggesting is that you've got these inchoate frustrations, 
but they are packaged up and turned into resentments by opportunistic elites. Those elites are not just politicians, they're also media elites. So you're absolutely right. Um, and as soon as you point to an enemy, which is racial, ethnic, religious minorities, uh, political elites, and so forth, um, then the search for the enemy within begins, and which is how we get paranoia, which is how we get conspiracy theories, which is how we get looking for communists in the government during the McCarthyist era, or looking for Jews uh, in, the, in the government in Eastern European countries as subversives and so forth, right? So, so I think there is a way in which these real concerns that you were talking about, Sam, um, are then create a kind of a fertile ground for a lot of these misinformation and conspiracy theories. Um, and I think one thing on this, on social media, um, in some ways I'm surprised it's the first time it's coming up. It's often uh, the first topic people want to talk about when it comes to these, uh, these issues. Um, I think it's a still to some degree an open question exactly what, how unique a role social media is playing in the, in, in the fomenting of this form of politics. Um, it's, clear that it's, it's clear that it's making an impact, but in many of the misinformation campaigns, many of the discursive frames we've talked about well precede social, the advent of social media. Um, we think about Fox News, right? the role of Fox News uh, and the way in which that impacted politics, but we can go way back um, in history. So the question is, and, and then when people do um, empirical research on social media, it's really hard to just to, to estimate those effects, right? Echo chambers exist, yes, but they're linked in interesting ways and they're not quite as bounded as, as we often think. Um, so I think there's still an open question exactly what is, has changed, I think, it's, there's an acceleration for sure. Um, there's an easier access to the information. And I think there is also asymmetry. So Yonkai uh, Bankler and his team have looked at the degree to which these kind of extreme media organizations are plugged into mainstream media. And there you're absolutely right. There's a large asymmetry between the left and the right. The right has this sort of social media comp, you know, industrial complex you mentioned. It has a lot of extremist media organizations like Breitbart, et cetera, which funnel di directly into Fox News and into more mainstream right-wing media organizations in a way that there's just nothing corresponding to that on the left, despite occasional efforts to do so. Um, so there is the way in which this stuff just gets more rapidly um, disseminated and, and, and more intense on, on the right, for sure. Hi, uh, Eric McDaniel, University of Texas. Uh, Bart, coming back to what you're talking about with the misinformation and how the more misinformation that's put out there, the more people support them. What I, the way I try to explain this to people who are having a hard time understanding this was this might be a weird example, but think about Black people doing the OJ trial. It's there are a lot of people like the issue is I don't care if he's guilty or innocent. I just want to win. And if he has to lie, cheat, and steal to win, he, he wins. Uh, I think, you know, 20 years from now, people are like, yeah, that was a mistake. But I think there's something about uh, kind of what's been mentioned earlier, and if you had mentioned earlier, about the idea of you feel like you're under threat, you just want to win. So I think the OJ trial, you're coming off the uh, LA riots, all of these things. And so there's this very strong sentiment that, and, and, and there's no, just like evangelicals kind of tying themselves to Trump, who is no way attached to them. Same thing with Black people, the OJ, who clearly pushed Black people away. It was just, we need a win. And I think no matter how we get this win, this is going to take shape. And then, then you see, just like you saw religious leaders glom on to OJ as, you know, he's persecuted just like Christ. You see the same thing going on with Trump. And I think it's, um, that's the analogy that I try to use to try to explain to people, uh, especially black people, like what's going on here. I'm like, think about how you were 20 years ago with OJ. All right, you swore up and down he was innocent, even though you knew he was probably guilty, but you didn't want to admit to it. And no matter what came out, you were like, no, 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 he's innocent. Uh, I think that's the same thing going on here. Which demonstrates the power of collective identity. And one thing we haven't talked about, surprisingly yet, is polarization in the US context. And the degree of politics becomes more zero sum over time. And it's my team, no matter what, using whatever means necessary, right? Um, yeah, great point. Yeah, I think, I think Eric actually sort of makes part of the point that, that, that I, I wanted to get to about that, that need for the win. And I think this goes back to what I'm hearing is concerning me. and. and and, and to go back to your point, Sam, that I take seriously about the very real suffering that, that, that is out there. But if I understand you right, and I think that the big issue for us is, is this is a bad metaphor for a, a real problem. Um, 
and I think it's something a little bit different, right? Because um, the problem actually shifts until it becomes, this, as Eric says, this need for a win no matter what. That's now a different problem. That's a different problem. And I'm thinking just as a, a, a quick example, uh, not as famous as OJ, uh, uh, I happened to uh, be interviewing a guy a little while ago in rural Wisconsin, guy's doing fine, white guy, a lot of Trump flags, that's why I'm talking to him. Uh, and he's next to the Menominee Reservation. And he starts talking about all the money they get. And he's completely wrong. They don't. Um, and uh, he's also got enough. So this is not actually a bad metaphor for a real problem. This is grievance switching. He does have a real problem, which is the erosion of democracy, the crumbling of things and so on. But he threw that problem aside. And now his problem, the real problem is his whiteness. That's the problem. It's not that whiteness is a bad metaphor for his real problem. He gave up his real problem. And I think embraced this and took on said, my problem is whiteness. And therefore this is not the bad metaphor for the solution. This nationalism is the right solution to my problem. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Jeff Charlotte, uh, Dartmouth College. Kind of just one very quick thing about that. I think that's a terrific point. Um, and it suggests, you know, there's kind of people who were puzzling after the Trump election. Well, why did suburban middle-class whites vote for him, right? They're doing okay. Uh, and I think this is where it becomes a sociotropic issue. It's not about necessarily that I'm not doing well, but maybe my cousin's cousin is not doing well. Or maybe, you know, in the media, I see people like me are not doing well. And you fill in the blanks of what that means. And very soon it becomes a collective status threat, not an individual status threat. It's about threat to the to the to the place of white Christian Americans in a group a status group hierarchy in the United States that then becomes the grievance, even if you yourself are doing okay. A couple of quick responses or, or additions. Um, first, uh, relative losses are still losses. Um, they're experienced as losses. So it's not necessarily convincing to people to say, well, you know, you're still doing okay in, in absolute terms. Losses of status are, are genuine losses are sometimes more powerful, more important to people than material losses. So I think that's worth worth bearing in mind. Also, and you know, there's more here than um, than than Trump, but of course it's come up for, for obvious reasons. I think it's really essential to distinguish between um, the, the median Trump voter and the marginal Trump voter. The median Trump voter is a Republican who votes for Republicans. That's the vast majority of people who voted for Trump and they like some Republicans more, some Republicans less, but they vote for, for Republicans. That, do, that doesn't require any vast explanation, I think. The marginal Trump voters are a much smaller group, but a crucial one um, electorally that are a little bit different. And these are people who might not vote for anyone in the past, might not vote regularly, might not vote for Republicans, but in this case did. Um, and I think if you focus on marginal rather than, than median Trump voters, um, these questions of relative loss, including status loss, become, become more powerful. That, all of that said, things change. And the, the origins of an identity don't necessarily or fully explain the deployment of that identity later on. So it, it's, it's entirely possible that at some point, um, polarization and group identity breaks free of any substantive uh, uh, explanation. Um, but that doesn't mean it wasn't there in the first place. Okay, folks, it's been brought to my attention that it is 12.05. Uh, so we're going to wrap up this morning session, which was amazing. And um, we will uh, we'll reconvene. Yes. Yeah, so uh, we, we, are, we are recording this and we are hoping to post it. Um, but we encourage folks to come back uh, in the afternoon for, uh, for, the live, for, for the live stream. So uh, we'll pause the recording for a bit now and hope to see you all at one.